Master Blazer Arbuster Kipling for Laser Light. When the blazing heat of working the grids gets to me, I chase my thirst with Laser Light. Laser Light, the toast of the galaxies and the official sponsor of the 3097 Interstellar Ball Blazer Championship Games. And welcome back. To recap while we were gone, Zarda has pulled dramatically ahead, scoring twice against Crockett, putting four more big points up on the board. Of course, he's told to die. This could spell the end for the Earthling. He is dangerously close to a shutout. Okay, they're facing off again, and we're moving close to the end of the day. And here's the wall. Crockett's heavy. <laughs> Swallow my hand, grabs a fan Speeding up the sound, let me get the right plan Coming down the wire, through the knee, my free Nice up the sound for the A to D One more with the rhyme, a steak can win a Big up a bob and a TV dinner I'm the one to win that dance contest Cause you know I dance the best All you gotta do is do your thing, you see Cause I don't give a fuck who you're supposed to be My name is a rock and I aim to please And I gotta spread love in society We got to keep the party going on All lifestyles, our shapes and forms We got to keep the party going on What you saw, what you heard, I get involved, I might disturb, and if you want, what's going down, you might just get that silky sound. So what you want, so what you need, I got the forms, you want to read, get in the game, you got a scheme, all the same, I got the team. More new way, not OG, walking down the block, you say, yo, D, when you're coming out with the new CD, that's what's going to make society. Welcome to the Sound Test Live, my personal celebration of video game music in all of its forms. Though today we're going to be looking through the lens of Lucas Arts, who, being about 40 years old as a company, are going to be the perfect lens to look at video games as they have evolved and how video game music has evolved with it, and indeed how Lucas Arts as a company has evolved with it. But that's just setting out the store for today's show. First up, I'd like to say hello because it feels like a year since I last did this entire rigmarole even though it's only really been a month it's been one of the most packed months of my life and as a result I think feel like I've just completely forgotten how to do this so this is like a fresh start completely brand new so who knows what kind of mistakes might occur tonight who knows what kind of things might pop up and derail me but that's going to be part of the fun what I can absolutely guarantee 
is an insanely stacked playlist this week. There really is a lot of stuff on today and a lot of stuff to talk about too. And I think that this is probably the first time I've ever done a playlist that's pretty much completely chronological time-wise because it starts basically at the very beginning of uh, LucasArts as a company when they were known as Lucasfilm right up to uh, the very end of the company in the last game that they both developed and published. We kicked off there with Ball Blazer which is one of the most popular remixes um, ever submitted to Remix 64 uh, in this case by Romeo Knight and it's a remix of music from Ball Blazer which was one of the first two LucasArts games ever, ever released. I've even got the date for it right here. 1984, when they were still Lucasfilm. Was it Lucasfilm Computer Division or something like that? And it's a really interesting title, Ball Blazer, actually, because it still had generative music back then, and it had uh, music made up of loads of tiny, really tiny, tiny little riffs that would play pretty much completely randomly, so the tune was never the same. And that's really, really interesting stuff. And that was put into place by a guy called Peter Langston, and that uh, version by Romeo Knight samples the C64 version of Ball Blazer, uh, which had its music by Russell Lieblick. So there is a lot of credits to get out there, but nice one. We're on a good start. We're blazing. We're ready to go. We're ball blazing. And uh, we're going to kick off first off with some non LucasArts stuff because it's all LucasArts after that. And I thought I wanted to get a real party atmosphere going. I'm in a good mood. I'm ready for this tonight. And I wanted to kick things off really strong with one of my absolute favourite tracks uh, from the last run of the Sound Test Live. One of the tracks that we played, oh god now, it must have been three or so months ago, but I haven't been able to stop listening to it since. When Jerry let me know about the Res soundtrack, which I'd never really heard before, I just couldn't stop listening to Fear is the Mind Killer. <laughs> Fear is the mind killer. <laughs> 
Not In Control by Empty Tables from the album Lost Astronauts. And Empty Tables is joining us in the chat right now. And those right there that you've just heard, that excellent, excellent tune, isn't just a good tune, but it is in fact the stakes of this upcoming one-off sound effects showdown because of course we are doing things a little bit differently on the sound test now it's not a weekly show anymore it's uh, more like a monthly show so i think what i'm going to do is one off sound effects showdowns and whoever gets the most points on that one query will win a smaller uh, physical prize and in this case i am holding in my hands a physical copy of the album lost astronaut by empty tables which i've been listening to all week myself and it's such a dense incredible work it's full of all kinds of incredible synthscapes and strings and there's also some big fat beats on there as well we'll hear a little bit more from that in a minute uh, but empty tables who is a sound designer got in touch with me this week talking about how much he enjoyed the sound test and uh, sent over a copy of lost Art astronaut to me and i thought it was excellent i thought it would be a cool thing to give away as a part of this one-off sound effects showdown and empty tables himself agreed with me so shall we in fact play this round of the sound effects showdown and see who is going to win a physical copy of this album and then we'll hear one more track from it and then we'll get directly on to the lucas arts train so this is three sounds from three different games and you guess what the sounds are and what the games are that they're from for six points in total that's one point per sound and one point per game these sounds are deliberately a little bit more prominent and some of the more obscure choices I used to use and I believe have even been in play before because I wanted things to be a little bit more up for grabs with such a cool prize to give out. So here we go, three sounds from three different games. And twice more. And for the very final time, hopefully these are some slightly more distinctive sounds. And to whet you players' appetites uh, for this physical album that the winner will actually receive, Lost Astronauts by Empty Tables, let's play one more track from it. And it's actually a quite diverse album. There's a lot of different sounds on there and a, a lot of different um, experimentations. As I say, synth, strings, there's even some female vocals on there. Really, really cool stuff. We're going to hear one of the more banging tracks near the end of the album. And this one's called Hostile Space.
a complete and utter banger there courtesy of empty tables who it is fantastic to see in the chat as well and don't you forget you can win yourself a physical copy of that entire album just by playing the previous sound effects showdown that we played just about five minutes ago uh, but the one big bit of rust considering it's been a while since i've done one of these live shows is i completely forgot to tell you how you can get in touch with me with your answers and indeed how long until i give out the winner well actually i've decided to leave you guys in suspense there's going to be a whole month up until the next live show until i actually reveal who's won this album and uh, send it off so you've got a long long time because i know i've got a few like audio boom only listeners who like take a while to get there because they're still catching up on all of those crazy episodes that i did throughout uh, 2020 so you've got a whole month to get in touch with me on twitter where I'm at green tea 128 of course. Um, where else is there? There's probably Facebook, where you just search the sound test. I think that's the easiest way to get to it on Facebook. I'd never use that goddamn thing anymore. And of course, there's the sound test Discord, which is linked uh, in the description, or at least it goddamn should be. I haven't been in the Discord for a month, but I will be coming back. Just had my head buried in the sand a little bit while I was trying to make sure that the LucasArts podcast was as good as it could possibly be. So speaking of Lucas Arts, let's get onto that train and start running through this amazing chronological history because we've still got so, so much to get through on today's show. We're still in the 80s as we move into Maniac Mansion, which was probably one of the most prominent Lucas Arts titles from the 80s. They, of course, released a lot more between Ball Blazer and Maniac Mansion. But we have to stick on the most prominent games, otherwise we'd be here all week. The most important game after Ball Blazer was probably Maniac Mansion, where George Sanger came on board, along with a couple of other composers, David Warhol, David Hayes, and Dave Govett. That's that three Daves right there. And I haven't even noticed this. This is incredible. We've got three Dave composers, right? And we're about to hear from Maniac Mansion, Dave's theme.
as we move to the very very end of the 80s in 1989 lucas came out lucas lucas arts came out not just george lucas on his own that would have been impressive uh, with their very first indiana jones adaptation which is of course a movie series that they would do justice many many times across uh, their uh, uh, what would you call it i was gonna say career but lucas arts don't have a career do they whatever moving on that was actually from indiana jones and the last crusade the action game which is a more obscure title when it comes to indiana jones stuff but it was in fact the very first one however that was from the game boy version released a couple of years later uh, and the music is by mark cooksey who's a complete vgm legend actually so it's really really interesting to hear his stuff and also to get some game boy stuff on there because obviously with this being a chronological show we're going to start out with a few chippy sounds and everything's going to start to reflect fine and get more and more red book audio and more and more live instrumentation but no we're still in chippy territory at the moment and as i say it's nice to dip into the game boy stuff just a little bit because of course uh, lucas arts are most known for their adventure games on uh, various personal uh, home computers uh, obviously all the secret of monkey island games and all things like that the point and click scum adventures uh, but one of the earlier ones that predate uh, a lot of that stuff even by a couple of years is Loom which a lot of people who were there at the time still hold as one of the very best LucasArts games of all time but unfortunately has just slipped into a tad of obscurity I've watched a little bit of this game on YouTube since uh, making the LucasArts episode and it looks just beautiful and considering i've been doing some point and click streams lately i think this might be one that i want to check out of course george sanger made big leaps with midi instrumentation for loom uh, representing some tchaikovsky swan lake music and in this case we're gonna hear uh, hetchel and the elders Thank you. 
Just beautiful stuff there from George Sanger and, of course, uh, Tchaikovsky, uh, but released in the very same uh, year as Loom in 1990 uh, was the first Monkey Island game, The Secrets of Monkey Island, which was predominantly composed by Michael Land, a complete legendary name in the world of VGM, who would, of course, later on team up with his friends, Clint and Peter, and uh, make even more of a name of himself uh, through all of those incredible adventure games that LucasArts worked on throughout the 90s. But right at the start in 1990, really kicking it all off, along with games like Loom and before it Maniac Mansion, was The Secret of Monkey Island, where Michael Land worked pretty much on his own about a year before Clint and Peter came over to join him. And I've seen also a credit for a fella called Patrick Mundy. And uh, I'm not entirely sure how much Patrick uh, actually had to do with the music. Uh, because if you've listened to the LucasArts podcast uh, that premiered just before uh, this live show, you'll hear that a lot of these old LucasArts composers, even themselves, can barely remember what each other wrote. I think Peter himself makes a a little joke about that about how they all listen to their own stuff from back in that time and they're like hang on who actually wrote this so i've been finding it tough to find out information on exactly what patrick mundy uh, did with secret of monkey island so i've given him an and or credit just to be safe but i'm pretty sure that this absolute classic uh, is from michael land it's opening themes and intro from secrets of monkey island Thank you.
God damn that tune. I have not been able to get that out of my head for about the past month while I've been working on the uh, LucasArts ST2 episode. It's so good. It's one of my absolute favourites. Now, I remember just dropping it under Clint and just thinking, oh yeah, this is sounding so, so nice. And then I found it drifting in as I was trying to get to sleep, as I was walking my dog, as I was washing the pots. It was creeping in all around the place and you know I found that I never minded whatsoever. I've seen that labelled as Beach from Monkey Island 2 LeChuck's Revenge just one year later in 1991 when Peter and Clint had come along to give their friend Michael Land a hand with the music at Lucas Arts. However that was from of course the special edition of Monkey Island 2 that came out in about 2010 because things all Although music, um, music and video games was evolving really at a rate in 1991, it still hadn't quite reached the point of being able to put something like that out. So of course that is the special edition version. But we heard one of the original versions in the ST2 episode and I wanted to give a little bit more time to that whistled version because it's actually so, so lovely. Especially since I've had that melody in my head all week. Great to hear it in a different version. But moving to the very next year, 1992 a very very prominent game is Super Star Wars kicking off in fact the Super Star Wars franchise that uh, then went to adapt the entire original trilogy of movies into Super Star Wars uh, video games all of which had actually really quite incredible music by Paul Webb all of which being the original tunes by John Williams but the job that Paul Webb did in making that stuff like as orchestral as it could be and as rich as it could be on a Super Nintendo was actually years ahead of its time. It's really, really incredible stuff. And from the previous ST2 episode where we had an in-depth look at all of the Star Wars music and spoke to Paul Webb, one of my absolute favourite tunes to show that off, the depth in his SNES Star Wars orchestral music, was an interesting one. It wasn't one of the main themes, one of the big busting brass tunes. It was this intriguing little number, Jawa Sandcrawler.
Absolutely loved that one when putting together the Star Wars episode uh, just previous to the one that's come out today. Because, of course, being Lucas Arts, they are have basically going to be involved in pretty much every Star Wars game that's ever come out, at least as far as I know. I think there might have been a couple of weirder ones that have slipped out along the way. Did Lucas Arts have anything to do with that one that had all the Stoom, Storm, Stoom Trumpers? <laughs> Stormtroopers dancing and things like that. Have you seen that? Where they get like Boba Fett doing break dancing and things like that. I don't know if LucasArts had anything to do with that. But they did um, basically back pretty much all of the really, really good Star Wars games. And X-Wing was a quality early one from the year of 1993. With again, the trio of Land, Bajakian and McConnell locking together for some really interesting stuff. They're not just um, playing with with John Williams melodies slipping in some original stuff as well and the year of 1993 in which X-Wing released really was crazily prolific for LucasArts they released a lot of very very interesting titles X-Wing really was just the beginning of it and it's actually interesting to note that X-Wing I think was the first game that still used the iMuse generative music system whilst not being a point and click adventure it was still able to use that generative stuff even though it was space battles and things like that so that was a really really cool uh, development but check this out we've got about four or five games still to go in just from 1993 alone so i don't know what was in the water uh, at um, lucas arts back then but next up we've got day of the tentacle which is another really big title another really uh, good example of the land mcconnell bajakian um, collaboration going on and it was actually a sequel to maniac mansion which went all the way back to the end of the 80s and this is a banger called tentacle disco i can't tell you who it's by because i don't think even the composers can
from the Mega Drive version of Zombies Ate My Neighbours, Zombie Panic, originally composed by Joe McDermott, who was the principal composer behind Zombies Ate My Neighbours, which also had a version on the Super Nintendo. And it's one of the more interesting parts of the um, ST2 episode that we just released about LucasArts history, because uh, George Sanger is credited not as a composer, but as a producer. And he goes into quite some depth into what he thinks that actually means because it seems like he wasn't actually sat behind the knobs and recording everybody or having any kind of a role in the sounds or anything like that. It seems like he was more of a philosophical producer, spurning them on and uh, helping to provide the right atmosphere. And it's really, really interesting stuff to hear George talk about that, about how they wanted to approach it like being the Beatles of game audio. So Zombies Ate My Neighbours is an absolutely fascinating release. Staying in 1993, this incredible prolific year uh, for LucasArts, and I think that's going to be just about the only time I'm going to be able to slip some FM synthesis, or at least some Sega Mega Drive FM synthesis into some uh, into today's show. Uh, because we're starting uh, to move into some interesting territory here as live instrumentation was becoming more and more on the menu and we've got a big big jump forward of that coming up uh, in the in the tune after the next one but sticking in 1993 for a little bit let's hear some of sam and max hit the road which was again a very very important point and click adventure game from LucasArts very prominent very very popular and another one that I would like to play because I seem to remember actually playing this in the early 90s but it's a very hazy decobwebbed memory and we couldn't do an episode of the sound test without me saying decobwebbed could we yet another game in which land mcconnell and bajakian came together what an incredible trio that they turned out to be and this is a track called highway surfing
so coming out of that absolutely crazy year 1993 in which it seems like LucasArts were on something with the amount of things that they were releasing kicking forward a couple of years into 1995 we have one of the most underrated and one of the most interesting releases when it comes to game audio at LucasArts that was from Full Throttle and the track was called Born Bad by a band intriguingly enough gone jackals and that's what makes it so interesting is it's one of the few times that LucasArts have ever actually licensed music for use in their games because of course with the various different composers that they've employed over the years they've barely had any need to and I believe actually took a certain amount of pride in the uh, incredible music that they were putting out in their games so probably thought we don't need to license all of that much but full throttle was a really good example of those licensing music and it was peter mcconnell who was mostly involved in that game and also wrote some music alongside the licensed stuff you'll be able to hear peter talk about that game specifically i'm not sure if it's in the next lucas art special or in the red book special to come but we did talk about it um, as a part of our interview and it was was around that time 1995 when uh, red book audio and cds and things like that was starting to become uh, more and more of a thing and starting to become more and more the dominant way of uh, formatting music for games um, and that same year we heard something just from michael land that really helped to push that as well from a really great game called the dig a fascinating release in uh, Lucas's catalog. Lucas again, we're just referring. Let's just refer to it as Lucas from now. Who, whoever cares. So Michael Land here working entirely on his own uh, without Clint and Peter, because around this time they were starting to uh, split apart and take games on for their own. And we're gonna hear some of uh, Clint's individual stuff and Peter's individual stuff later down the line. But first up, this is an absolutely epic tune from The Dig and Michael Land solo mission to the asteroid.
just outstandingly beautiful, truly incredible piece of music by Michael Land from The Dig there. And I'm going to have to go with that, I think, already as being my pick of the week. I was going to leave it till I got to the end of the show today and maybe have a look back. But no, that's hit me on a real, real deep level after a busy, busy week of working what an amazingly dense piece of music that is, Mission to the Asteroid. Interesting side point, that after all of these different uh, genres that the LucasArts composers work in with these different games, they've essentially kind of done it all. Michael Land has gone on record as saying that the music from The Dig, which is almost all like that, really lush, slow chord changes, it's almost all like that. Michael Landers said that's the type of music closest to his own individual style. So that really, really is a very pure expression of Michael Land compositional ability there. And it's just so good. That's really taken my breath away. But I happen to know that this next track, jumping forward a couple of years into 1997, is pretty much just as good. And I've been really, really excited for this all night. This is an absolute banger from Clint Bajakin. In fact, I don't know if banger is the right term, because to me, banger just simply means incredible tune. This is Clint Bajakian at his very best. In 1995, as we heard from Full Throttle and things like that, CD audio and live instrumentation was beginning to become more common. But by 1997, it pretty much was the order of the day. It was pretty much what everybody was using. So Clint Bajakin was able to push that to its absolute limits at the time with his soundtrack for Outlaws, which really is a true highlight uh, in his catalogue, this Western-inspired first-person shooter, which actually was quite innovative when it comes to multiplayer FPS games. And this is a tune that I wanted to include in my LucasArts ST2 episode that we had today, but I've had to hold back on it until the Red Book episode of ST2, because he specifically spoke about this track uh, with a Red Book framing. So I've had to hold it back you'll hear it in st2 but let's hear it now in isolation the ballad of dr death Thank you. 
Wing Commander Surf there, and there's a lot of information to get out here. You would be correct if you are a LucasArts scholar in wondering exactly what we're doing in Wing Commander territory. Well, uh, George Sanger was involved in some uh, Wing Commander music, and that is a version from his band, Team Fat, giving it a kind of surf twist. Uh, the music was originally composed by Dave Govett, actually. Uh, but Team Fat does feature 
Dave Govett um, on the drums, with George Sanger himself on the lead guitar, Joe McDermott, who we heard from earlier on with the Zombies Ate My Neighbours stuff on rhythm guitar, and Kevin Phelan on bass. A live performance, and this is in uh, George Sanger's own words, live at the CES show in what year? The mind boggles. Indeed, a lot of these guys struggle to remember a lot of these things now going back like 30 in some cases. 40 odd years this stuff is absolutely insane but that is a real deep cut there i just wanted to jump off the lucas arts train for a second to give a little bit more love to george sanger who has written a lot of, well actually done a lot of surf based music versions of um vgm it's really really interesting i mean that was nearly english but we've got to have a little bit of that in the sound test as well what i was essentially trying to say is this is not the first time that he has rendered vgm in surf versions is in in fact whole albums out there of that kind of stuff and he sent one of those over to me this week so i wanted to include it with some such good stuff in there there's actually going to be more of it in the next st2 episode so look forward to more vgm surf it's actually amazing stuff as we uh, continue with uh, 1997 because we dropped right back there into as uh, george said himself what year the mind boggles nobody knows getting back into 1997 the same year that outlaws was released what a trio of tracks that was there the dig outlaws and uh, wing commander surf so so good and moving now into the curse of monkey island it's tough actually to know whether that track from the dig is my pick of the week which i wanted to bring up again since shady was absolutely right in the chat should be pick of the month shouldn't it now that we're in a kind of new schedule on the sound test live so we'll go with Pick of the month, and now I'm confused since there's been so many great tunes and there's still more to come. So maybe I'll have to, I will actually have to retrospectively change things at the end of the show. For now, from Curse of Monkey Island, this time just from Michael Land. Michael Land took uh, care of this Monkey Island game entirely on his own. A cartographer reformed.
Well, we heard some solo Michael Land, some solo Clint Bajakian on Outlaws, and we even heard T Team Fat, not Tim Fat, Team Fat, having a surfy go at Wing Commander music. And now we come firmly into Peter McConnell territory for one of his best known and best loved games, Grim Fandango. Absolutely celebrated and rightly so. Absolutely love Grim Fandango. And as Jerry has said in the chat, it's definitely something I've got to go off and replay. Certainly before the iMuse uh, episode of ST2, because I want to make absolutely sure that I can talk about some of the fiddly little details that can kick up through using iMuse. That was The Enlightened Florist, a short but really rather underrated tune on the Grim Fandango soundtrack but then again the Grim Fandango soundtrack is full of so many incredible themes and great great tunes and uh, by 1998 which is where we are at this point iMuse is getting pretty damn advanced and so is the development of CD audio and that's precisely why Peter McConnell was able to get such rich and interesting sounds into his Grim Fandango soundtrack but now let's move into some Something that actually got Peter McConnell into a little bit of trouble. If you listened to my previous episode from ST2 all about Star Wars, you may already know this story. But Peter McConnell, just like Michael Land and Clint Bajakian and various people throughout the 90s, was heavily involved in various Star Wars games. As we move, it, move into the year 2000, uh, we're going to hear something from Star Wars Force Commander, in which Peter McConnell decided uh, to give a kind of metal guitar twist to one of John Williams' most well-known melodies. And he actually got correspondence from Skywalker Ranch basically saying, no, bad Peter, don't ever do that again. So let's hear exactly what got Peter into trouble. The Leviathan remix of Imperial Rage. I think this is great.
So, from one of cinema's worst collection of bad bastards in Darth Vader and all of his underlings, essentially represented there by Imperial Rage, we move into one of real life's worst collection of bad bastards in the Nazis, and that's Nazi Infiltration 1, alternative from Indiana Jones and the Emperor's Tomb. Uh, I think this is going to be the last time that we concentrate in on Clint Bajakian's music, who came back. I actually don't think he was working as an in-house composer for LucasArts anymore, but in 2003 came back uh, to take on the role of music for Indiana Jones and the Emperor's Tomb, which was a really, really big kick forward uh, for Clint. You can hear about that in the Star Wars episode as well, which does touch a few times on uh, Indiana Jones games adaptations. And for Clint, that was the first time working with uh, an actual full orchestra for a portion of the score. And he did really incredible stuff. If you ever sit down and listen to the soundtrack to Emperor's Tomb, it's really breathtaking. Like, this is the first time that he was playing with live orchestra. I mean, it's just so sophisticated and some of the most complex music I've ever heard. It's truly incredible, showing just what a musical chameleon Clint Bajakian can be. We've already heard that across this show and hopefully through ST2 as well. And that tune reminds me a little bit of, um, is it Alan Silvestri's stuff for um, Predator? It's a bit predatory, that one, isn't it, with its rhythms? Um, it's kind of creepy jungle rhythms, even though it's Nazi infiltration. Na jungle Nazis. Jungle Nazis. That's a, that's a movie for you. There's a pitch. Uh, but by this point, LucasArts were pretty head in the sand with their movie adaptation video games. They, they'd unfortunately moved on quite heavily from the uh, personal computer adventure game stuff that they were quite well known for, the colourful point-and-click games. And we were mostly seeing a lot of Star Wars games. And a big prominent example of that in the development of Star Wars games is, of course, Lego Star Wars, which has then gone on to be a gigantic franchise of its own and also influenced, well, Lego Indiana Jones has been a thing, the Lego Batman games as well. There's all sorts of Lego games, Lego Dimensions, which brought Portal to the table. But I'm pretty sure that uh, Lego Star Wars was the first to do that kind of thing. Uh, in around 2005, and this time I'm going to hear an interesting John Williams remix, very very short, unfortunately short because it's good, by David Whittaker in this case, who's an absolute legend of uh, British VGM who goes all the way back to the very very early 80s, so it's very cool that he's uh, still able to be working on big uh, name games uh, in the 2000s cool that they're able to maintain these big long careers david whittaker war legend but let's hear this little ditty from lego star wars star wars disco <laughs>
A lovely little ditty there from Thrillville Off The Rails, the DS version released in 2007. I don't actually know the title to that. It's one of those ones, one of those game rips where it's all just got like weird data titles rather than anything that actually means anything but yes from the ds version of thrillville off the rails as i say by this point in lucas arts again we're going to say it lucas arts career lucas's career at this point in lucas's career uh, they really were concentrating almost exclusively on developing star wars games but they did still publish uh, some non-star wars games without developing them and thrillville and thrillville off the rails respectively are a pretty fun example of that i believe it's basically kind of roller coaster tycoon kind of gameplay so it was hard to find actually but i unearthed a little ditty from the ds version of thrillville off at the rails and if you can find soundtracks for the non-DS version of that or for the original Thrillville please let me know because I'm really really intrigued uh, to hear it and I haven't been able to find it anywhere and if you want to give yourselves a laugh I didn't pronounce the composers involved in this DS version and uh, scroll down to the now playing not while we're live because it's not there yet but after we're live and uh, look at the names of the composers involved in this game and imagine me attempting to pronounce them, because I'm not going to attempt to pronounce them. It would probably give me lockjaw. Instead, we're going to move into 2008 for our final little pocket of music today. We've got two more tunes in a cooked up sound test pocket, and then we're going to end up with something that Shady requested that I'm a little bit yeah, well, we'll explain that when we come to it. But this is kind of the final chapter of LucasArts before it was uh, acquired by Walt Disney, unfortunately, and has kind of disappeared ever since around 2013. We're going to hear something from a game called Fracture here, which was developed by Day One Studios, but was actually uh, published by LucasArts. It's a futuristic third-person shooter, and this one was extremely difficult to find the music to again but i was able to track it down and we'll hear its main title from chris tilton i believe but a couple of composers were involved in this as well and it's actually really really lovely music considering it's almost impossible to find
really amazing track to finish up our Lucas Arts focus on today's live show. That was Off on a Comet from Lucidity by Jesse Harlan. And Lucidity is a really interesting title in Lucas Arts growth, or rather, I'm sad to say, death, because released in 2009, it only really had about four years of life left, and pretty much all of those years were dedicated entirely to Star Wars, because this was the very last game, Lucidity, and it's a rather obscure one, to be both developed and published by LucasArts without being some kind of a Star Wars adaptation, so it really is an intriguing title, especially that it holds that honour and yet has kind of fallen into obscurity. I'd never heard about it until I started to put this show together. We've got genuinely great music there from Jesse Harlan, so a fantastic way to end today's show. Where I think looking back, I'm going to have to give uh, probably a four-way pick of the month, actually. Let's go for that. Four-way pick of the month, one for each week in the month, uh, because I want to give it to Michael Land's uh, Mission to the Asteroid from The Dig. I also want to give it to Ballad of Dr. Death from Outlaws, so that's one for Clint. I also uh, want to give it, strangely enough, to Imperial Rage, uh, which really got me today. So that's one for Peter McConnell. And finally, Wing Commander Surf, one for George Sanger and Team Fat there, also really, really got me. So today has been a really, really stacked and full show of great tunes and all also interesting history so we, before we move into this very last track that i've got cooked up for you today shall we jump back quickly and hear these sound effects once more because uh, allow me to remind you that you have a whole month to get your answers in through twitter where i'm at green tea 128 discord or facebook where i'm the sound test for an actual physical copy of empty tables album lost astronaut which we heard from earlier on in the show and was indeed both dense and banging so you're going to want that and here is those sounds three different sounds from three different games and twice more And for the very final time. So before I introduce this very last track, I think I'd better talk a little bit about what indeed is happening next for the sound test because I did that on the last podcast and things are all a little bit more up in the air now with it being a kind of more monthly schedule. Well, here's the struggle that I see ahead of me is that the next episode of ST2 is a is the final part of the LucasArts triple bill that concentrates entirely on iMuse. And it's a real beast. It's about... It's, well, it's almost twice as long as the other two LucasArts parts themselves. So it's going to take a lot of work. Uh, so I've got double the material and I've got February, which is, of course, the shortest month. So I'd be very surprised if I could get this done for the very end of February. So I think instead of that, we're going to be looking more at the very beginning of of March, uh, where you'll be able to hear the next ST2 episode and indeed the next live stream. Also throughout February, uh, Bethany is preparing to come and actually move on over here with me from Ireland. So that's a big process for the two of us. So we'll have to see how things go, but I'd be very surprised if it didn't make it by the second week of March, at the very, very least. Keep your eyes on my social media feeds and you'll find out more about that. And after all of the LucasArts 3 parts of stuff we'll be looking a little bit at that game company who of course are behind games like journey such a huge game journey flower so many classics i think there was that ps3 kind of bundle you can get and i got all of them and just like wasted so many hours on their incredible ambient arty experiences so that's what's next to come after lucas arts what's next to come right now to finish the show it was requested by you shady but it was requested when i released it 
and that's why I feel a little bit sheepish about this because it is self-indulgent. I'm going to be finishing up uh, today's show with one of my One Night VGM things, which you've probably seen by now. Uh, one of the things I've been composing in my attempt to stretch my muscles ready for a hopeful VGM career, maybe in a few years' time. Who knows? Who knows? Let's just play with some music and see what happens. And Shady was such a big fan of the last one that I released that he actually formally requested it, and you did he requested it, and you did in the comments when I released it, and I thought, you know what? It's pretty much the only request I've got. I'm gonna honour it. And especially because, you know, I am somewhat proud of it, and I do have some listeners on Audio Boom who I don't think are connected to any social media feed or YouTube or anything like that so may not have known that I've done this so if you're intrigued as to what some video game music might sound like by me I've written something here in the style of hypnospace outlaws cool punk genre and this is a really rather large track called cool punk paradise thank you very much for sharing tonight with me
great taste.